so freaking cold out. I'm not a I'm not a huge fan of snow personally. Yeah, but well, me neither. And you're in Pennsylvania, right? Yeah, I'm in Chambersburg. Wrong place if you don't like snow. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I grew up in New York, so it's Got nothing. It. I knew what I was in for. I've never left the Northeast, um, but I'm half Jamaican, so you, it's in my blood ah, too. Got it. Really, not want to be cold. Yeah, we got snow here. We're in uh, we're in Indianapolis, so Midwest weather could snow in April and then be seventy in February. You just that's how it goes. But, yeah, that's like I was in Denver. Like, gosh, it's so long ago now, but. I flew in and it was 70. We like hiked, did everything. I went out in the blizzard like three yep. days later. <laughs> so <laughs> just yeah, keeping I'm, you on your toes, being dynamic. Yeah, right. Colorado, they they get weird like us. And yeah, you just never know what you're going to get. So it's like, is it going to be a cold winter? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, throw in global warming for what it's Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so yeah, per um, my email, uh, Tim and I just, after we finish he and I will do like a two to three minute intro. We'll attach it to the front of the episode. And then we send everything to you um, for final approval. Or, or if anything is like, hey, I didn't like how this sounded. Or, hey, can we cut this? Happy to do so. But we just like to keep it pretty raw and conversational. And uh, yeah, yeah, kind of go from there. That sounds good. All right. So maybe uh, if we just kind of start. Uh, oh, but do you prefer Rachel, Dr. Day? What, what do you prefer? I... I prefer Rachel. Okay. And part of that is just in my branding. I think a lot of physicians put that space between themselves and the patient, right? So usually people come in, obviously, but for respect, they say Dr. Day, but at some point they slip and they'll say Rachel. And I'm like, that's the highest form of flattery. That means yeah. that I am legit doing my job the right way. So okay. I'm, I'm fine with that. All right, cool. Um, so yeah, maybe just uh, kicking things off, kind of background about you, kind of how you got started. I know you said um, you, you're friends with Doug Bertram, which is super funny. Uh, he's been a good resource. Yeah. So maybe if we kind of uh, start where uh, you kind of started school and stuff like that, and then get mm -hmm. to where we are now. Yeah, absolutely. So like I mentioned before, um, do I actually introduce myself? Yeah, yeah, why not? <laughs> probably, probably yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I'm Dr. Rachel Day. I'm a board certified dermatologist. I'm the founder and CEO of One Skin Dermatology. It's a skin health and wellness practice based in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. So I'm a transplant to the area. I'm a native New Yorker. I was born in the Bronx and I was, I'm actually, as I mentioned, half Jamaican and half white. So I was born in the Bronx. Um, my mom, who's white, then married my stepdad, who's Hispanic. And then we moved to New Jersey. So I'm like a total misfit when it comes to just like the, the cultural, physical, all of the attributes that you're kind of like, I don't really find a place. Um, in New Jersey, it was a pretty, you know, affluent area in general. My parents both worked full time. My dad's a physician. My mom's a nurse. And so in school, I'm a firstborn, which I think is important to note, because when you're looking for a place to fit in as a firstborn, you're like, you've got that tenacity. So I always excelled in academics. I was really athletic. I was, you know, a freshman starting on varsity volleyball. I got recruited to play division one volleyball at Lehigh University. Um, and somewhere along the way, I just sort of gave in to that inertia. That's like, okay, if I just continue excelling, 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 doing these things, um, then I'll be happy because I'm doing these things. And there was always that letdown at that moment, that critical moment where you've achieved whatever the goal is. And I first noticed that in college. So at Lehigh, I actually went into the business school, which now to me is pretty funny because I consider myself an entrepreneur, but at the time I felt so out of place because my parents were in medicine and everybody else at the time, this is pre-recession, you know, 2000 and uh, five, <laughs> so, okay. yep. 2004. And everybody was like Lehman Brothers, JP Morgan, the big four, like it just had that, that bro culture that, you know, a girl who was born in the Bronx, moved to New Jersey, played volleyball was like, I totally don't fit in. And so right. I wimped out and decided, you know, I'm going to go where I have the most nurture and support. And that was the medical field. So I switched into arts and sciences, Along the way, I tore my ACL twice. So that was the end of my, <laughs> my collegiate career. And 
I had a really awesome physical therapist. So while I was rehabbing and trying to figure out like, what is it that I'm going to do? Um, what you have to pick a degree at some point, right? I literally right. looked at the credits that I had and I was like, okay, I'm not staying longer than four years. <laughs> so mm-hmm. what's going to fit the bill and decided that I would become a physical therapist because it sort of aligned. I had a great experience mentorship and I got into a program at Cornell, um, Cornell medical school the summer of my junior year. And they were basically what, like, why aren't you applying to medical school? And I was like, I don't know. I never really, I, in, in all honesty, I was never like, oh, I'm going to be a doctor because no one ever nurtured, like within the university, you know, nobody ever really nurtured that part of it. And so long story short, I got admitted early to Cornell Med and kind of started off there. So going to medical school then became a track for me. You kind of get on, you're like, okay, these are the things and totally fed into my type A-ness and desire to just like be the best um, at things. <laughs> it, and I come by it honestly, you know, um, I have much more self-awareness at almost 35 than I did at, you know, 22 when I started medical school. So it's helpful to look back um, in that lens and recognize kind of where I got off track. And in medical school, you know, dermatology was the most competitive field. And I really like the fact that you could do everything that you needed to do by yourself, right? Like you, you could take that skill set and apply it in so many areas. And foundationally, you had to be excellent at medicine to be a great dermatologist. So I did that. And then I wound up in Chambersburg. And that's kind of a funny story only because my husband is from outside Philly. So neither one of us have direct like connection to Chambersburg, but money makes the world go round, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when you're in medical school, I graduated with 400, over $400,000 worth of med school debt. And I think that's wow. an important figure to put out there because I'm not unique in that scenario, right? So I, I you have to understand the risks and benefits of investing in that level of education. Um, and so I thought it was the, you know, we came here to practice in Chambersburg. I thought it was a great opportunity to be the only dermatologist in the area. And it was a similar thing where I arrived and I was like, wow, this is a total letdown. And what I thought my, my gift was to share with the world, right? Like here I am, I'm practicing. I'm feeling like I don't have the time, the space to connect and treat patients the way I want to. And that's actually how we met Doug is my husband is an orthopedic surgeon and our kids, our kids are best friends. So my okay. oldest daughter introduced us to the, the Bertrams oh, nice. and it was like the energies of the world aligned and Anne and I, Doug's wife became great friends. And we were like, I think that our husbands would really like each other because obviously Doug has an orthopedic wellness center and and in meeting him, that's kind of how I caught the entrepreneurial bug. You know, we'd be hanging out and I'm like, just tell me more about what you do because you're doing it on your own terms. You're really happy. You feel fulfilled. And I have this huge void where I'm like, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing in terms of, you know, showing up and getting the work done, but it just feels like a one-way flow of energy. I don't have the ability to practice on my own terms and again, share the gifts of medicine and the training that I have in the structure that I want to. So 18 months in, I, I quit for various reasons, but I decided that it wasn't worth continuing to operate within the structure of the insurance system and in kind of the big eating little system that's happening within healthcare overall. It's, in my opinion, a system that focuses on it's an illness-based system, right? You interact when you have a problem. Mm -hmm. You don't go in to nurture a relationship that allows space for you not to have to go in if you, when issues come up because we're keeping you well. Mm -hmm. And in deciding to found one skin dermatology, I knew I didn't want to be unidimensional, right? I didn't want people to think of this is a dermatology office because I had the lens that I really want to create a, you know, health-based lifestyle ecosystem 
that people interact with and take away more than just the education, right? It's like the feeling when you come through the door, it's the relationship, it's that you get high quality care and nothing is in between, you know, the patient that's in the room with me. There isn't a computer, it's just me, my staff, everybody, the whole ecosystem is just a different vibe. And I learned a lot of that from Doug and just having Doug services and, and um, how he sets up his business, but it's a long-winded answer. That's kind of how I, it's kind of how I got here. <laughs> no, that's good. I think that's great. Um, and it's cool that, you know, it's funny, your parents were in medical. Now, now you're in medical. Uh, what did your parents do? So my dad's a nephrologist. So he's a kidney specialist mm -hmm. and my mom was a pediatric, um, pediatric nurse doing like cardiac caths. They, my mom now does research at Mount Sinai. So she's into like big clinical trials that are like oh, wow. multi-country clinical yeah. trials and has been published more times in the New England Journal than I have, which is exactly zero times. Yeah. So, <laughs> so just a totally different focus and that's cool. My dad has much more of that entrepreneurial spirit. So he has some dialysis centers and has like the largest practice in New Jersey of nephrologists and servicing the area in which we live in. But ironically, there was no immediate support for me deciding to jump ship and drop out of insurances and kind of mm -hmm. do my own thing because it's so, it was so foreign, right? It's not a move that most people are doing. And again, I'm going to kind of lean on Doug that there was proof in the principle of it. But when I look around at dermatology, there's no one doing at the time that I decided to do it the way that I'm doing it. Now, mm -hmm. there are a couple more practices coming up, out, but I am really one of the first dermatologists to, to step back and say, medicine, being a doctor, having all of this knowledge, it's a skill set. It's a tool, right? It's something that you can implement decidedly and very like decisively into a business model that serves both you and your patients and then support and nurture the other aspects of that person. And they come to you for other things, not just dermatology care. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that's going to be much more of the trend. You know, 2020 was about survival. 2021 is like all about self-care, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Right. You give, you gave all of your energy to your neighbors, your family, you know, the New York times reading it compulsively, if you're like me and, <laughs> and now you're just like, all right, I'm going to set a hard, hard boundary and say, this is the year that I really look inside and say, okay, how do I use the lessons that I've learned throughout the pandemic and recognize that's not going anywhere. And if you keep just doing the, the regular way, it's not going to be successful. That window of profitability within the traditional healthcare system is closing and it's pinching everybody except for the insurance companies, which, right. you know, boasted billion dollar profits last year during a pandemic, which is crazy. <laughs> yeah. So, so you're more, you're a cash practice then? So I'm a hundred percent cash practice okay. and it's called direct care. And the idea of the, behind the model is that you directly partner with the patient. So my four core values of our business are transparency. So paramount, all of our pricing is on our website. You can literally go there and be like, this is what my problem is. This is how much it costs. We don't send bills here at the end. Yeah. Um, accessibility. So if you call around to your local dermatologist, I would imagine that to see a dermatologist, and I'm not saying someone who just practices dermatology, but a physician that's been board certified uh, as a new patient is probably on the order of like, you know, four to six months on the short end. And in my area can be as long as eight months. Mm. So that accessibility is a huge um, support that we provide to the community and then accountability. So if you go to a doctor's office and you try to call, how likely are you to get a human on the phone within, I don't know, 30 seconds, I'll say. Yeah, it varies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, like 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 pretty much like no, right? No, no. <laughs> pretty much no. They're gonna ask you to leave a message or you know, you have to wait or you're not getting off 
that phone for a period of time. And in my world, time is my greatest currency. I can't get it back, right? I've had, I'll share later, but some experiences that have really just sealed that for me. And so I value other people's, mm. right? I say, we're gonna show up for you and these are the ways that we're gonna show up for you. We're gonna be accountable to your care. So if you need us, right, we're not gonna say, you know, you haven't done X, Y, Z, we're gonna make it happen for you. So we have multiple levels of access and our, our community of patients um, really feel comfortable with the support that we provide them. And then the last core value that we have is community. So we are so interwoven into the Chambersburg community when it comes to really relevant issues that came to light in the last year, you know, social justice, you know, really asking the hard questions and being a part of that community conversation and a safe place for a lot of um, groups that don't traditionally have advocacy at at the level that we're talking about. So basically as a doctor, you know, on my door, I have our mission statement. And so every single person that walks into our practice will see it. And it says, we promise to preserve the, uh, we promise to preserve the care in you and your one skin always, you know, irrespective of your age, sex, gender, identity, um, disability, or language. So it doesn't matter like how you're showing up for us, we will meet you with respect and with grace. And that's not the case, especially um, in communities that are not as, that are not as diverse as other areas, right? So I did all my training in New York City, one of the most diverse places in the world. I live in a place where um, I'm probably the greatest marker of diversity for many people and have experienced that you know, firsthand, but it, it's important to be bold in that. This is not a conversation that we can be on the sidelines about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's great that uh, you found a way to intertwine yourself with with your people, your community, and and things like that. And I remember when Tim and I talked to Doug, going back to you being a cash practice, it it eliminates the ability for insurance to dictate care because that's that's Correct. really what happens. Um, they, they dictate what you can do, how long you can do it for, and, and it kind of almost traps patients into the system. And it's like, you need insurance, you hope you never have to use it, but you still kind of need it as, as that net. Um, so, you know, I've, I've seen, I work with another chiropractor, a friend of mine, we sh- share an office and, and he can do so much more in an hour for less than what insurance would bill you in another chiropractor's office for 30 minutes. And so I'm Absolutely. sure you've seen the same where it's like, you can practice how you want, how you think you need to, or less or so. Cause some people are like, oh, they met their deductible. I can charge this, this and that. And it's like, it just goes to insurance. So I think that's uh, to your point, you said that's like going to be the trend um, going forward is cash practices. And I think that's, that's how it should go. I agree. I think the system is broken and relying for relying on like this patchwork of partisan, whatever has been happening over the last several years. I actually had my dad give me a rundown of like, what, what does like Obamacare mean? Like, what does it really mean? I want to try to understand it. Um, but the pandemic has left so many individuals uninsured or underinsured, right? And underinsured means you may make and the, the median income in my community is somewhere around 53000 a year. Uh, if you have a $3,000 deductible before you're able to get coverage for your care, that is cost prohibitive, right? That's, that's just like too much money before you can decide, okay, then I have to split a share and like my insurance kicks in. So I'm a full believer in insurance. I, I think the way the system is structured is you need to have catastrophic coverage. But if there were more cash options, you could look at the landscape and say, okay, this is what it takes for me to maintain just routine maintenance care, right? In a transparent way. Like I just met with a direct care uh, internist who is about 30 minutes away, his practice. And we're going to do trading spaces. You know, he's going to come down and have his practice down here a couple times a month. And I'm going to go up in my staff and we'll service 
that area a couple times a month. And that, that added value to the ecosystem of his patients in a transparent way, you know, you, you are never able to get how much does it cost if you call. You say, mm -hmm. I have a rash, how much is it going to cost? So they're going to say, it depends on the codes. And you're going to say, what are the codes they're going to use? And they're going to say, it depends on what happens in the visit. So mm -hmm. there's zero transparency in your ability to prepare for that. And you can't protect yourself against billing that you have no ability to, to be able to anticipate, right? Mm -hmm. You're just going in blindly. Like who would do that? <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, it makes it tough because, you know, a lot of things it's like, oh, they do need to see something first or, you know, how, like, what is the reaction? What is it? So some of it does depend on seeing the person, but yeah, I get how it's like, oh, well, we'll see what happens. Well, the other thing is, is that the system is structured. And I know this only because I was, I became like a master at the system. I was excellent at coding, you know, I hit all of my bonus marks for the short time that I was in there. And it's not hard to do when you learn it and it's not illegal. You're just using the set of rules that mm -hmm. exist. But the individuals in my previous practice that got burned the most were those cash pay or underinsured patients. And I'm like, I can't justify the fact that I'm seeing somewhere between 35 and 45 patients every single day so when you break that down in, you know, seven hours of patient care, what's that five, 10 minutes, you know, in a room, then you turn around and all that I actually timed myself and I was trying to go slow and I was in there like seven minutes mm -hmm. and yeah. this person has to walk out the door and get like a $600 bill for me to say, yep, that's good right. because, because I'm coding appropriately, right? Because I looked at all the places, I did all the things Maybe we did a biopsy that adds like another 175 or whatever on there. And I look at my practice now and I'm like, somebody can send us a picture through a HIPAA secure text line. And if, if it's like an excision, like they want to have a cyst removed, I just quote them a price based on the photo. They come in same day, have the surgery. Again, time is a currency, right? They know what to expect. They get in and out and like, that's it. And it's done. And it's just worked so much better because you'd have, you just like can't get your problem solved when you're like in the dark about what it's going to cost in, in this day and age, right? Like everybody's got to be looking at where their money's coming from and how they're spending it and making sure they're making wise investments in this, you know, financial uncertainty <laughs> that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice that you can, you found a way to help more people with the care that they need rather than the codes you need. Yeah. And it's about the service, right? It's like, if you're not showing up for someone, it's never going to flow back to you. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I, I, I quit my job that I had a secure, very healthy income to take out a half million in building a building <laughs> to build a practice. Like if it's not coming from a place of service, like, why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. So the best investment I think is in yourself and developing what is your vision. And Doug, again, was really helpful in outlining uh -huh. what does that look like outside of a traditional illness-based system? Like when you are functioning to keep people well, how do you have to approach that differently? Like I respect that some people don't wanna take medications of a certain permutation, right? And I don't say, oh, well, then I can't treat you. It's like, that just starts the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. What are your values? How do we make sure that your treatment plan is in line with your values so that you're compliant? Like if you give everybody the same treatment, most of the time it's not gonna work out because everybody is individual. They have different things that motivate them. And I think that now, you know, spending 30 to 45 minutes in an average visit with a patient, like, we have such higher compliance. We have happier patients. It's just, it's a totally different vibe. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure that relationship with, with Doug, which is super important, being able to hear his insights on how he started his business. I want to ask you, so like, what did that, pro like once you developed that relationship and were ready to take that jump and take a huge risk of, of quitting the stable job, what did that entire process look like of, 
I know you said you had to take out a loan to, to build the building and everything, but what did that whole process look like of assembling your business and, and forming it? So um, chaotic. <laughs> That's like the honest truth, but it's, it's all on you. Right. Mm-hmm. And there were certain points, like, for example, the first step was I, I need to get my own malpractice, right. I'm going to be practicing medicine. Like, how do I go about doing that to get malpractice? There are two different types. There's occurrence and claims made one, you pay it all year by year. And it covers something called a tail, which is if somebody sues you in 15 years, it comes out of that pot of money. And then one of them, if you close the policy, you have to pay a tail. And typically the tail can be anywhere between like, you know, 10 and $30,000, depending on how long you practice, et cetera. The reason I'm mentioning this is most people get the all-inclusive so that if they decide to just close the policy, um, they don't have to worry about the tail coverage. And I was like, if I get that policy, I'm basically saying to myself, I am not willing to do what it takes to make this business a success. I'm not willing to like get down there, (laughs) you know, scrub my own floors, scrub the toilets, you know, figure it out. Because if I close my policy, that means my business has failed. It means I'm no longer showing up and taking care of patients and serving. And that was one of the first, that sounds weird, but it sort of set mentally up that decision that, if I'm going to do this, I'm going all in. This is like a cannonball into the deep end. I will figure out how to swim. I have zero business background. And so I did what I think most smart people do. You ask for advice and by ask you pay for it. Mm -hmm. Right. So I got a um, coach or like a, a startup coach that basically said, this is what keeps you out of jail. These are the, like, these are the things that you, right? No, but it's important. Like there are so many things that you don't know, rules, regulations, safety, and you could spin your wheels and spend your time trying to figure it out yourself. Or you could be very, you know, knife-like and say, this is the body of information that I absolutely have to master. I don't need to reinvent the wheel. I need a structure on which to build the stable business. And so I considered that part of the investment that I'm doing foundationally. If we have a shitty foundation, it will crumble. And so the that's like the totally unsexy part of operating a business, right? Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> like the who does the manual yeah. and like are we doing the training? Yeah. Like that. So, and that's not me. I'm a Pisces. I'm like a total like let's flow, <laughs> like let's dream, <laughs> let's do things big. Um, But I recognized that if I ran the business like that, I would run it into the ground. So self-awareness was huge in in deciding to make that jump. So I think to anybody who's thinking about a business, know where you're starting one, you know, becoming an entrepreneur, like understand what your strengths are. CEOs are not meant to be managers, right? CEOs are meant to be thought leaders, thinkers. They're the ones that are moving the needle and you still need to construct a team that is going to be able to execute your vision if you're the visionary. And that's what I think about myself in my my practice is I have a vision that someone, a team that I assemble has to be able to execute because I know where my North Star is. I know what I'm shooting for, but the structure and the infrastructure, infrastructure has to be there. So to do that, I took my team from where I previously worked. (laughs) So so I got uh, my nurse and my scheduler to take that leap with me. And when I say got, I, I told them my dream, you know, I told them on paper, this is, you know, these are the numbers. This is the problem that I want to solve. And they've experienced it because they worked with me, right? They ran and managed my practice. And so they could understand all of the pain points and how we were going to take steps to solve those pain points and become the go-to place to have this certain very different type of experience when it comes to your skin health. So being able to be super specific about what it is that I want to build and then get that team, um, that, that I think was really critical, but so is the money. So if you're not willing to either self-fund and we did a portion of that in the beginning, cause I didn't, 
from like deciding to actually opening, it was only about six months. Mm -hmm. And part of that is I, I left under, um, I'll say duress. <laughs> it was not, it was not an amicable departure. And I decided that it was basically sucking my soul dry. And if I stayed any longer, it was going to have like irreparable damage to my ability to, to thrive as like a provider in the community. So I left the big, the big system and was just like, I'll figure it out by myself. And we did. So I think team is super important structure, being willing to go all in. Some people will, you know, part-time or side hustle, whatever people like to call it now, but have a revenue stream separate from what their vision is. And I actually think that's a huge hindrance if it's not in alignment with what your vision is. Because if you could rely on, if you think of like a faucet, right? If there's a faucet of revenue that you can kind of just like open when you need a little bit more or close it, like that's going to take your time away. That's going to take your energy away. And you're going to become dependent on that faucet instead of dedicating your most valuable resource, which is your time and energy on building your brand and building your business. Mm -hmm. So I, I really fought the temptation to get some sort of part-time something to have money come in. And instead we just, we planned, you know, we knew we strapped down on our finances and we made sure that we were like very strict with a budget. And every single month, my husband and I were having like budget meetings that again, you can imagine were like boring, <laughs> <laughs> but necessary. Yeah. But so necessary, like all, like the best people in business are the ones that understand the practicalities of the situation. Like, you know, it's, it's timing and kismet and all these things, but you have to be ready to receive. Mm -hmm. And if you're not putting in the work and being ready, like you're going to totally miss the boat. Right. It's, it's funny. You had budget meetings, uh, a guest Tim and I had on last year, Ryan Mickler, he's got his business order of man and him and his wife have like, I don't know if it's monthly or weekly, like meetings about their finances. And yeah, he's in the camp of, you know, we should both know what's going on. So nothing happens blindly. It's like, oh, we just racked this up on this card. And and so, um, yeah, I think that's super smart that you guys planned it out. Like, hey, this is where the money's at. This is what we can do, what we can't do right now. So yeah, I think that's pretty brilliant. I think that there's, there's fear in being that vulnerable with yourself and with your spouse, right? So everybody, like for me, for example, I like, to buy things that are expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there's, there's like that sweet spot of like quality. You're self-aware. You already value. said it. You're self-aware. <laughs> yeah. And, and I take care of them, but I not, I can still buy and not have, it doesn't bring any joy to my life. Mm. So if I am like stressed or like overeating, whatever your, your vice is, right. That becomes like a crutch and a hindrance. So money is really important. Money gives you access. If you are not watching your flow of money and I'll, I'll know when I'm feeling a little stressed because I'll look at my cart and I always wait like 48 hours before I buy something. And that was a policy that I instituted yeah, because great. it's an, emo it's like an emotional thing. I'm like, Oh, this will make me feel better. If I just have this one beautiful, whatever it is like handbag. It's mm -hmm. like, it didn't actually add to the value of my life. Mm -hmm. I have another handbag that carries my shit perfectly. Yeah. And so now I just have like a second one that sits on the ground and I would show you, but I have approximately like four handbags in my office. So <laughs> <laughs> See how many days were, did you have to wait for all four? <laughs> right. It's just like, but, but, but money is important. And especially as a woman, um, I would say my, nobody's really talking to women or at least hadn't been in high school and college where I would have listened to understand the power and the value of a dollar, right? You want to work smarter, not harder. Like mm -hmm. I think of my time as a dollar amount. Every single thing that I do, I put a dollar amount on that time, kind of like a lawyer, right? And that's how the practice is set up too, in the sense that medical procedures or medical um, visits, I want them to be commensurate with the skill and the value that we're holding and still be accessible. So a new patient, a new patient visit 
is 125 to 200. You know, that's not, we're not talking like astronomical amount of Mm -hmm. money, but it allows an access point that then we're able to cultivate a relationship. And so one person in our practice can single-handedly over a year spend five, six, seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000 because we've nurtured a trust and like delivery cycle with them that then they're converted to cosmetic patients. And it's more of like, you know, let's really dig into that wellness. What makes you feel good? Let's come from a place where you feel empowered making these decisions. And we're not like a minute Botox clinic. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I'm always super transparent with women. And I'm like, if you're coming here to feel better about yourself, you're like in the wrong space. It's not going to happen for you. Right. You need to come in here as a celebration of empowerment that you're like, you know, what? I'm going to take care of myself and this is how I'm going to do it. And that subtle frame shift, I think makes one, the experience for them so much better, but for me, I don't want, I don't want to be, you know, doing procedures on people that gives them this idea that I'm changing anything about them except for their appearance, Mm. right? Like they're the ones that have to do the deep work as to like, what is my motivation for this? And I always ask that question, like, like why? Because I am just as happy doing a skin cancer screening as I am doing like, you know, somebody's lips. It's, (laughs) I, I, I choose to spend my time in this ecosystem. And so anybody who wants to meet me at that level and come in, I don't think, oh, you're more valuable than the next person, right? Each person has the same same value proposition to me and it's about that give back. So what I'm putting out there, if I feel like I'm not the right person to take care of this person's aesthetic journey, I tell them that. Sure. And it's not like, like you, what you're looking for is not what you're going to get with me. And I want you out of respect to have the absolute best experience that you're looking for. Yeah. It's like, you know, you're interviewing them as much as they are you too. Like it, it's got to go both ways. Totally. And that's the thing that I think in medicine is most being I mean, sort of bastardized is that when you sell when you're selling accessibility, right? Minute clinics or when you're like a bottom dollar, you know, come as your access point, you're not going to grow and cultivate and nurture relationships that will ultimately provide that long-term revenue stream, Mm -hmm. right? You're, you're going to grow and compete for a body of patients that will not be loyal to the environment that you're creating. So you're working really hard constantly to generate new leads instead of saying, okay, every single lead is like a diamond. (laughs) (laughs) Every single lead needs to be polished. Every single one needs to be formed and shaped and solidified so that they couldn't possibly go anywhere else. Sure. Right? Because they can't get what they're getting from you and your environment and your ecosystem anywhere else. I like that. Yeah, well put. Yeah. And and like, is what would you say like from that moment where someone meets you for the first time and you 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 nurture that relationship? What what does your practice kind of do differently than than other ones that that the first things that come to mind to 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 establish that relationship and that trust? Yeah, yeah. So I am like a super smiley person and, (laughs) and I, and I, I, I'm being serious, but I love to have fun. I love having fun. I love celebrating. I love parties. I love party planning. (laughs) So my, my office itself, just in decor and aesthetics, Mm. it is meant to feel elevated, but comfortable, right? Like my toddlers run around in my office and like, I don't care because it's meant to feel lived in right? We have an entire room that's like a pediatric room dedicated to the experience of children getting dermatologic care. Mm. So that attention to how are they feeling? And I'm, Mm. I keep going back to the fact that I'm a Pisces, but I'm like a super empath. And so I'm always putting myself in someone else's shoes and saying, what does this experience make you feel? Like I, in the beginning, would I sit in my waiting room when I first opened the first, you know, six or so months, I would spend at least an hour, you know, over the course of the, the week, just sitting and looking and like, what, what does somebody 
what is the view that they're seeing? How does that make them feel? And if I saw or felt something that was like, I wouldn't like that. I'm like, let me change that. Let me make sure that that, that line of vision that they have, it's giving something back to them. So it's a very neutral, but warm experience just coming in. And then my team, my team is like badass, you know, <laughs> everybody that we've, we've grown. So we started with three, now we have seven and everyone meets me on that level. You know, I'm, I'm totally about that energy. So if I meet you and I'm like, ah, our energy is not right. It doesn't, I don't like interview people. Mm. I have a conversation and then I'm supposed to check references. And I'm like, I don't really care what somebody else says. If my energy doesn't vibe with this person's energy, like nothing that's written on paper is going to make me decide I'm going to hire that person, right? Mm. And then if I vibe with that person, nothing that's written that's negative is going to change my opinion because I know what I'm looking for. So I know what my business model is and what my sort of ideal relationship partner or entrepreneur within my business is. And that may be something that rubbed that other business owner the wrong way, that they were too eager, that they were this, or that that environment didn't nurture those aspects that I find so special. Mm. So I really don't um, put any stock in somebody else's opinion, you know, unless it's like they stole from me. Right. <laughs> or, yeah. So, or like something they've got, super yeah. egregious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, they're so a convicted think, felon, by the way. Yeah, all, like we do like those things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, uh, but as a whole, I'm kind of like, I don't really care where yeah. you've been. Like if you're willing to go all in and see the vision and feel it, like let's go. And I think that's cool to look at it from a lens of, hey, maybe it wasn't this person that I'm talking to. Maybe it's the person of reference where they didn't like you know, how much of a go-getter this person was or their excitement level, their enthusiasm. And so then they got a negative review. Yeah. I'm, I, I, when I started this episode with you guys said, I'm a misfit. So <laughs> I am, I am the person that, you know, always asked the question that made people go, is she really going to ask that? Yeah. I'm really going to ask yeah. that. I'm like, <laughs> why not? You know, why can't we ask these questions? Why can't we say these things in residency? you know, they make you do so much stupid shit. And I would be like, please just tell me why this is worthy of my time. Right? Like, tell me how you're not wasting it by asking me to do this exercise. What is the educational value? And, and people don't like, in general, people that ask questions, where I would say, I absolutely love when people are asking the right kinds of questions. If you're asking a question that's like, just displays a lack of knowledge base, then I just tell you, go look that up, right? Like that's not my job is not to be your Google. Um, but if you're asking critical questions that make me think about, you know, my, my business or our, our why, why, do we, why do we have this system in place or why don't we have this system in place, you know, then you're adding value because maybe I just haven't thought about it. And maybe that's something that I'm not speaking to. So I'm a, I, I just, I don't know. I think it's important to be disruptive in a purposeful way. And that takes a lot of self-awareness and comfort. And so that's, that's what I'm working on with my business coach is making sure that I leave that space for my staff to be disruptive, you know, for them to say, cause I, I tend to run like 10, like thousand miles an hour. And I'm like, let's do this. Let's do this. I want to do that. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And sometimes it's not, let's go. Sometimes it's like, let's sit and let's marinate on this. Let's chew on it. Let's see how everybody else feels about it. And then mm -hmm. what's the system to implement this really great idea that you may have, but like, let's poke holes in it, right? Like, why is that great, but not great now? Why is that something that we should take some time to make sure we have the infrastructure and the bandwidth so that we can scale? So we're not just growing revenue, but we're growing profit and making that a team effort, right? So everyone down to the, you know, patient care coordinator that picks up the phone knows how much money we bring in. Everybody knows that my goal for the practice is that we will, you know, gross over a million dollars in the next two years, it will happen and we're right on track. And so it's, it's those sort of mission-driven and why? Because money gives you leverage for time and access. 
the more, you know, it's not about just like having all this money. It's that money allows you the stability to be intentional about what are you doing in your business? I opened October, (laughs) October 28th, 2019. So I was four months in to business when the pandemic started, right? Mm. As someone who was not insurance-based, so I got no CMS help, no like nothing, any of those relief grant things that you heard about, you know, that did not apply (laughs) to my business because it didn't exist. It literally didn't exist. And we brought in over half a million dollars last year. We not only, you know, one got off the ground, we thrived. And it's taking that, those foundational steps to get to know what is your mission? What are your core values? Does every single thing that you do in your business reflect those things? And, and listening, I literally will just like be with a patient and we're talking like we talk with you, like our visit is done. You know, the visit might be a, a suture removal, right? I don't charge for a suture removal. I just need to see them and take the stitch out. Mm-hmm. But we might spend 30 minutes just talking about, you know, like, like what's going on or who do you know? And the connections that I've made just by being present, not only in like body, but like mind being present. I, I always joke that I poach friends for my practice. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I've, it's, it's been such a gift to create the, that space and that time. And it's something that doesn't exist around here mm-hmm. and it should, it should exist in more places. And that's why I want to keep growing, you know, in revenue so that we can scale and give other like-minded providers, you know, in the similar, mm-hmm. like how Doug is, fr- has franchised his business he knows firsthand the benefit to the community, to the service that he's providing, to the give, and then to himself in the form of feeling fulfilled, loving going to work every single day, right? I never wake up and I'm like, I have to go to work. Like Mondays are my favorite day. I roll up here and they're just like, don't have another cup of coffee. <laughs> I've, actually, I've actually given up cap- Well. That's a lie. I had coffee today, but it's my husband's birthday. So I you oh, know, use it. anything as, as an excuse to have coffee. Yeah, right. but- <laughs> I, I had to back <laughs> days uh, as well because it wasn't doing anything for me. Then I knew I was, I needed to uh, back it off. Um, but I feel your pain. If there's an excuse, oh, I went out to breakfast. Okay. I'll have a cup of coffee. Uh, oh yeah. I mean, same thing with like a beer. I'm just like, oh, you yeah, have a beer? I'll have a beer. Oh, <laughs> it's Wednesday. Yeah. It, ends, it ends in Y. Yeah. I'll have yeah. A, yeah. The, the sun came down. Yeah. So, um, so I, I wanted to, since we're on the topic of, of scaling your business, I, I was curious and, and we've asked um, Doug this as well and interested in your answer of when do you know it's time to scale in the terms of um, adding another employee, adding someone on? Do you mm-hmm. stay as lean as you can, as long as you can, do you, you know, hire as soon as you're able to, uh, what, what's your process of, of scaling, adding people to the business, um, in, in that sense? So I, I, my answer, you know, even four months ago would have been different than now. And I think my answer now is, I'll tell you what I was said before is again, what is, what is your goal? Right. And are you plugging a hole? Are you hiring to solve a problem as opposed to having a plan that's a system that you are hiring someone that is going to add value through their ideas, through their presence, through their experience, you know, through their, you know, be an entrepreneur within your business that is going to help it grow and scale. And so I was plugging holes when I was hiring and Part of it was when you start with three people um, and we've got a 2,800 square foot, you know, office and multiple rooms and a high, high demand. Um, you just want somebody to pick up the phone, right? Cause if yeah. you're not picking up the phone, you're missing leads and da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. And so it, it became, we hired and then we look back and, and we're like, we did not set up our new hires for success. 
we didn't have a plan for them. We're just like, this is how we do it, you know? And it's, it was totally unfair because Alex Lindsay and I had worked together for like two years, like literally intimately together. And so we then were just like, oh, we need somebody to, to help us answer phones so that we can keep doing the things that we're doing. Yeah. And now I'm like, now we have, you know, SOPs, standardized operating procedure. We have a culture manifesto we have, and we're working backwards at this point with everyone that we've hired to really look at, we didn't provide the structure that was needed. Um, this is where we're going. And this is why I mentioned every single person knows what our financial goals are and how they produce profit, right? The person picking up the phone, they produce profit for your business. If they're a jackhole to the person on, you know, on the other line, yeah. or if they're rude, or if they put them on hold and forget about it, whatever it is, um, if they don't know how to adequately explain that the reason that we are out of network providers is that it allows us to really provide the best level of service and care for them. And that it would be a disservice if we had to hold them to what the insurance contracts needed. We 100% respect and understand their ability or their need to utilize their benefits. These are the other places you can go. If you need to see someone sooner, we could see you within two weeks. Right. Just even refining that language and that narrative, that is profit producing. Yeah. Right. Following up and nurturing that. Were you ever, were you able to see someone we can get you in? Right. Making it so that they're not going to feel embarrassed or uncomfortable that they were like, well, I need to use my insurance because most people get pretty offended on the phone. Like I get, I get a lot of like pray for her. <laughs> I'll be honest. Like there were there were like two in the last week, which things come in threes. So I'm expecting at some point, you know, maybe somebody will drop off a rosary. But <laughs> you know, it's 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 a misfit. It's like, how could you be doing this? And I'm like, you don't know what it means for me to not be able to practice or to serve, and what that means for my family to have to spend all of my family time worried about things related to a system that I can't control like we have 100 complete percent complete control within this environment and those boundaries are so important so back to your question of knowing you know when it's time to grow i set the expectation for myself when i started that i would not just work in my business that i wasn't start, i wasn't going all in to just be here seeing patients five days a week. Like this was not the final destination for me. And as soon as I had enough patients calling and we looked at my schedule and it was like, you don't have an appointment for three weeks, you know, seeing patients five days a week. I was like, it's time to hire. It's time. And, and I feel really blessed that I love to teach. And so I had a nurse practitioner student that had reached out before I even opened. And so she spent some time pre-pandemic with us, you know, January, February. And I reached out to her and, and kept that relationship, nurtured that relationship and said, you know, if you haven't found a dermatology job position yet, I want the opportunity to offer you to work here. It's not your classic position. You, and I said this and I, I don't mean it in any offense, but I'm like, you have no value to me other than the fact that you have the ability, you know, to practice medicine. You don't know dermatology, right? Like you're coming in <laughs> and this is not the, we just fill your schedule. This is like, you need to be coming in with the growth mindset that you're here to learn and you're here to like take off running and you'll be paid as somebody who's not trained right? Like you can't command a salary that would be typical for your credentials um, in a place like this. And I had actually one other mentee turn the position down because again, money moves the world and you need that right person that is willing to go all in. And I'm so glad that Megan did because she's a rock star. I mean, we have such a great ecosystem with Megan. She's seeing patients right now. Um, and I'm like, I'm here to support your growth goals. My growth goals are, I want to have a 
couple of practices within our area because there's such a need, right? The dermatology is, access is like piss poor around here. So just from a service standpoint, there's a lot of local work to do. And I'm like, I wanna be part of fixing that problem and providing a solution that is sustainable. And you're part of the solution. If you wanna learn, like sky's the limit. You can build a mini practice within my practice and let's do it together. So I knew from a hiring standpoint that I had to get someone to be able to mentor and teach to provide the services that I provide directly, you know, as a physician to give me the space to work on my business Mm. and not just in it. And I'm finally at that point now, Megan joined us in September. So we're about six, five months in. And I feel comfortable with her skill set to not have to lay eyes on every single patient that comes in because I know that she will not miss anything that is, you know, harmful to the patient and she knows where the limits are and she knows when she needs help. Mm. And this is quite literally like the first week that we're doing this. (laughs) So I'm, I'm having, I'm having a staycation where I'm like staying in the office. (laughs) Yeah. And good thing you planned this today. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, well, we were supposed to be in Vermont, but Vermont got canceled. So I was supposed to actually be, I know. You're leaving tomorrow or were you going to leave today? No, Vermont has like coronavirus restrictions. You need to like quarantine in Vermont. Yeah. And so it just But we can hop on an airplane. (laughs) I, right. I'm like, I don't want to be like, you know, the doctor that gets sensationalized on the news as like, they ain't cut the line. And <laughs> like, I'm just I'm like, I'm not really down for that. Let's just stay home. Also, I hate the cults. I wasn't too upset about it. Yeah. So staycation. Um, and then as term, in terms of like other staff members, it's Delegation. So I promoted Lindsay to office manager at the same time that we hired Megan, because I realized I was doing things that CEOs shouldn't be doing, right? Like there needs to be like a a layer in between and I need to be like, okay, Lindsay's going to take care of it. Whether it's like, like bill pay, like bill paying. Oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Right. I do the bill paying at home too. And I'm like, I I cannot spend like a whole day. Yeah. Sounds awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like talk about snore. So finances, yeah. <laughs> all the things that I don't like that I don't have, not even that I don't like, that I had enough intimate knowledge of that I no longer felt like I needed to be the one doing it because something would get missed sure. and making that warm handoff between my accountant and my lawyer and you know our community partners and this and that, um, our vendors, that this is Lindsay, she is like me. This is like the warm handoff. And so I'm on every email. I have access to everything and I trust Lindsay and she is much better at those, that like very nitty gritty detail, like stuff that I don't, <laughs> I don't care for. And then creating space for her to be able to grow in that position, we needed someone else that she could start, you know, delegating her routine tasks to. Sure. So, so again, it's a building that foundational layer And then looking at it as an investment, like I don't look at hiring a team member and paying them above, you know, average. It's embarrassing that minimum wage is like $7. Don't even get me started. Mm -hmm. So we look at what, for the positions that we're hiring, what is the, the community average, right? And then we offer like probably about $2 higher starting. And that allows I think a higher quality candidate and the opportunity for growth, right? And that skill set and that commitment, because that is such a value add if you can retain and not have to worry about constantly plugging a hole. If you have a path for someone and understand what their goals are and have that structure in place for them, why would you leave? Mm. Right? Like if you, yeah. if you invite someone into a culture that they have full transparency about, like, they know at the door whether it's the place for them or not and so if they decide to walk in it's like let's go again there we don't even we don't even talk about it you know it's just we're we're on that same path and 
that I think is, is so critical. So right now we are, we are fully staffed in terms of patients and people and things. And I have about a day and a half. So Mondays now I don't see patients at all in general. We just closed okay. my schedule on Mondays, Friday afternoons. I, you know, I'm supposed to be like self-care on Fridays, but I'm trying to, trying to hold myself accountable yeah. to that. And uh, Wednesdays in the afternoon, I also don't see patients. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's given the space for me to like, I've always wanted to do a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the access. Yeah. You're having the access now from, from yeah. a good practice. Um, what, what do you think your next pivot might be for the business? Do you, do you foresee anything else coming up where it's like, oh, you know, probably need to pivot this way, you know, market says this or, or care says this, whatever it might be. In terms of pivot, there was so, so much that was like sort of tested out last year, mm -hmm. right. That I feel pretty confident about our trajectory in 2021, that there aren't like, if there's another major shutdown, we know what we'll do. If there's oh. like, we have PPD, PPD, PPE for like literally like five years of masks. I, I also went into like hoarding mode and I was like, there are never going to be gloves. And so anytime I got offered gloves, I just like bought them, bought them, bought them. And I spent like an embarrassing amount of money. Again, why I need somebody else managing the like gross yeah. finances. Um, and, and now people can't find gloves and I've got like gloves for five years. So yeah. it's just- We know like where my, the gloves went. We know where the gloves <laughs> I'm like fully responsible for the shortage. Of, we don't point fingers, but we know <laughs> where the gloves went. So from, from a you know trajectory standpoint, um, we are adding new service lines and that's what we're really nurturing in that wellness space. The medical side is, is very solid. So they're- aren't going to be any changes on, on the medical side. Um, we have our plan as it relates to COVID-19 and supplies, like all of those anticipated changes. The space that I think is going to open up more in the market for us to have another, um, to solve another problem is what happens with, you know, the Biden administration and um, Obamacare. So, which is why I asked the question last night to my dad. Mm -hmm. So depending on whether they bring back the penalties, people are going to be, especially in this area where a lot of individuals have not only state-based, but high deductible plans, is if you have to have insurance and you have a, a, a you know, a the median income for the area, right, around... $53,000 and you have to have insurance for that, you are going to choose a high deductible plan. There is not going to be a Cadillac plan that you're going to be able to afford that is um, going to meet the needs. And so specifically messaging and speaking to and showing value for the care in a direct model, you know, that makes not having to utilize their high deductible plan if they're, you know, healthy, right? Providing those options and partnering with other direct care practices, like in, an internist that's, we can trade spaces, you know, that's where, where the growth is. And that's what I think is so nice about being nimble. I don't have to run it through like 15 channels. I can just be like, Hey, this seems like where the gap in the market is. Nobody's speaking right. to these people. Right. What is, right. what is the problem that we together we can solve for them? You can't get into primary care. Okay. In my area, you literally cannot get into primary care. And I, I said that to Dan, um, Dan Hodge. He's a really cool dude, by the way. Okay. We had, we had lunch, my husband, uh, Dan and I had lunch yesterday and just like, you know, three hours later, we're like, I think I'm supposed to like be somewhere. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a, that, yeah, that's, that's like a, a great sign, you know, when you're just able to shoot the shit with somebody and have, have those big picture conversations is, vetting the intention, you know, like the brand authority and loyalty that we have in our area. If I'm like, this is the guy that will take care of you in a 360 way, like your health, I would go to him. Like if you're looking for primary care and same thing, like, so we're going to trade services also, but if you need a dermatologist, this is the 
most transparent, easiest access, high quality. I mean, I went to Cornell, you know, like I'm, <laughs> right. we, right. we've got the credentials to back up everything else and intentional. Like I'm not trying to trick you and bringing, bringing that trust back to the healthcare marketplace, I think is, is a huge gap that we, we have to fill and hold the plug here in 2021. And then on the wellness side, I just hired a nurse practitioner that's been in women's health for 13 years and she's brought on bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. So much of my practice, I would say my, my target demographic that I speak to in my messaging are women between 25 and like 55 mm -hmm. because they're like me, you know, they're like early on in career, have kids, you know, or engaged or newly married or thinking about kids or trying to figure out that work-life balance, which I hate that phrase, by the way, because <laughs> it doesn't exist. It's such a huge myth, right? Work-life balance. Like the word balance literally means that like everything is just like perfect. There's a yin and a yang and it gives the sense of calm complete bullshit, right? <laughs> like, like there's like a season for everything. And my husband and I talked about this, like I'm in my season of hustle, right? Like the flow will come, but right now is the season of hustle. And so I don't think of myself as being any less showing up for my kids, you know, within the time that I have with my children, which is like every morning and every evening and every weekend, because that's how I've set up my practice. Those are the boundaries that I've set. But like, if I'm rolling out at eight, I'm not feeling like I'm missing something and I need to be worried that they're not taken care of because mm -hmm. we have, you know, the systems and the structures in place on the, on the home front. And so that creates the calm for me. It's a, it's a conscious decision about executing based on your values. And so if you value in yourself, having a business, having an entrepreneurial mindset, I think that that adds value to being a mother and showing my two girls and my son, you know, come in and let's go to mommy's work. <laughs> they love, they love coming to my office. All of them. That's like, great. we'll just like come on, come on the weekend sometimes. So like, you know, if I have to run in, they're like, can we come? I'm like, yeah, let's go. Yeah. So, oh, that's great. so I, I think that, that that's like a huge thing that's really important for women to hear. And especially women who a have no business experience like myself. So I will wear that hat proudly. But you also don't have to feel like you should. Uh, do you guys know, hope, hopefully maybe, Sarah Blakely? I've heard, yeah, CEO heard of some company. I've heard yeah, of her so, name. So I want you to remember her name because she's, she's like the coolest. And you can see it in my background, you see that red backpack back yeah. there? All right. So Sarah Blakely, she is the founder and CEO of Spanx. You know, that handy dandy little, yep. little garment piece. Mm -hmm. um, and she is the first female self-made billionaire. Mm. So my whole world changed when I, my husband and I set a boundary and we, we took a weekend vacation <laughs> in the middle of the pandemic and we were listening to Tony Robbins and he was interviewing Sarah Blakely and she had no experience in business. She sold fax machines. Yeah. <laughs> and, and she solved a problem right? Like people joke, oh, you just cut the, the foot out of pantyhose, as she would say. And she's like, yeah, but like you didn't. Right. Yeah. Right. Thought so of it first. Not, not only everybody has a million dollar idea. It's not just thinking about it. And that's the problem. People write it down. They like dream journal. And I'm a big fan of dream journaling, but they don't take action. So she like had the idea and then she took action. And so I was so inspired by that podcast that I'm like in the car, like looking her up and she started a grant called the red backpack fund during COVID to support female entrepreneurs. And so I, I applied and made a submission and I won the grant. Nice. And, and to me, that was like the rawest expression of my creativity and what I hope to serve in the world. And I a little bit hate the fact that I needed that external validation, somebody else to sort of rubber stamp it and say, oh, okay, now you can proceed to the next level where you feel like you can say you're an entrepreneur, right? So I want to say to anybody who's listening, like you don't need somebody to vet and validate it for you. 
but it's a nice reminder. And I, I keep the red backpack there yeah. um, as that very visual, like, why am I going to build my own ceiling? Right? right. Like, like there's absolutely nothing that if it aligns with my values and my intention, and I have the support and the structure around it, both it, at work, you know, in our ecosystem and at home with my partner, who's amazing. And like, I would be the only person saying, uh, no. Right. Like, yeah. like you have, you have to sort of own that part of it that you have to take action. You can't just like dream about it, think about it, talk about it. Like you have to take action. Yeah. Yeah. Someone, someone will end up doing it. And Tim and I are fans of Gary V. You've probably, probably familiar yeah. with Gary V. And, and he's like, look, speed matters too. Like, you know, you got to do it well, do it right. But speed matters too. So Me messy action, yeah. right? Like, like it doesn't have to be perfect. And gosh, the things that we've learned in our operations from just like opening our door <laughs> to, yeah. to now, we're just like, Ooh, that was, that was pretty ugly. And yeah. Things always perfect themselves along the way as you keep going. And, and it's, you know, that's his thing. And you know, Tim and I run in our own ships and it's like, they get better as you go along. So um, no, I think that's really cool how you've, you've segmented yourself. You you've grown, especially, you know, starting what four months before pandemic and then, yeah. and then still grew. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, it's really fun to hear your story, your journey and, and how you just approach things. I think, you know, you have different thoughts and um, different ways to provoke different types of thoughts, uh, especially with care and, you know, your environment. So I think that's super cool. And uh, Tim, did you have any, any more questions that you wanted to ask? Um, not, not on my, I think, I think I'm good no. on what I prepared. So, um, we always ask like kind of a final thought question, but I want, if, if there's something that you want to touch on before we kind of wrap things up, I want to make sure we hit things that, that you want to give to our audience and listeners and final thoughts, but we do have a kind of a final question that we always ask all of our, all of our guests too. Um, one, thanks for the opportunity. This Absolutely. is part of my, me my messy action. <laughs> so I was like, I was well, like, thank Doug, you for joining us. Yeah. Doug, how did you do that? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, all right, I'm just going to like send them a message. And so this was super cool. Uh, I, I love honestly hearing in my own, like hearing the words out loud. These aren't words that you speak to other people. These are not conversations that you're typically able to have out loud because mm -hmm. you need somebody who's like-minded to have the conversation. And right. it's just such a small group of people that are kind of scattered that just totally get jazzed about this. And yeah. that's such a gift to be able to, to hear that narrative because it totally reinforces like, all right, I'm walking the right path and it feels good, right? It's like that little dose of dopamine that you're like, that was easy. You know, you yeah. like hit the little button, you're like, I want to keep doing the things that just yeah. feel so natural and like yeah. in flow. You're on. So yeah. that's like, that's my last thing I want to share before you ask your final question. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so we always uh, like to know how people want to be remembered. You know, when, when your time here is is done, uh, how do you want people to remem remember you, Dr. Day, Dr. Rachel Day? So I'm going to use the word heroin and I want to be remembered as a heroine for, for misfits mm. because I spent so much of my time trying to fit into a construct at so many different levels that I was never going to fit in. And as soon as I just decided that the person I wanted to fit in was myself, right? Like to just have that self-confidence, um, that is the gift that I want to share with people. And that's what we do in one skin dermatology, right? It's my, my tagline is love my one skin. Like if you are not nourishing that relationship with yourself, if you're not sharing that gift that, with yourself, it's like, you can't possibly share it with anyone else. And I want anybody that I interact with, especially on the, the medical level, um, to feel that that's a gift that we've, we've, you know, that I've given them that permission to just fully embrace and accept who they are more specifically on like a broader scale, um, with, with the podcasts that I have coming out soon. Let's, the go. Yes. Let's go. 
the raw skin pod. Um, it's about that vulnerability, right? Women in medicine are not taught to live on that growth edge right there. It is not celebrated. And so if I can be a voice that is a catalyst for women in medicine who found themselves in the same position that I was in a couple of years ago, just in, in a world that they're like, this just isn't me. I don't fit in. It's not right for me. It feels bad in my bones and it's toxic, whatever that is for you, whether it's a personal relationship, whether it's a relationship with work, and there are so many different layers to that, but just at that core, giving them the permission and guiding and leading them in the education to just like, you're the only one that can change that. Mm -hmm. Like, let's go. You can do it and be their cheerleader. That's how I want to be remembered. I like that. That's awesome. Well, you will have to let us know when you're going to launch your podcast. Got to, got to give us. It's you know. yeah, for sure. It's, I have my, I have my little jingle opening. Okay. <laughs> we spent so much time on intro and outro music. Oh my gosh. Yeah. We... One of our musician friends actually did our outro music too for us. So it was super cool. Yeah. But, I like, uh, I like, I like your intro. Yeah. It's uh, I'm going EDM style. I'm just oh, like, respect. I want like that, like that vibe, you know, where you're mm -hmm. just like, Hmm. The flow. Yep, yep. Like, you, like, yep. like you might not even catch what I'm saying because you're yeah. just like that beat. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. And cut it off right before the drop. <laughs> yeah, that's, I literally said that. Welcome like, to the Raw Skin Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, could you time it where it like really hits? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like, yeah, okay. That's awesome. Well, Rachel, thanks so much for joining us. Th thanks for reaching out. Um, you know, we, we love when people are like, hey, you know, can can we be on the show? And, you know, love when it when we can get a time and and just have yet yeah, fun conversations. Like you said, have these open dialogues, you know, easy access, but uh, things people don't always talk about but need to hear. So thank you yeah, for your, your time. We know it's valuable um, and there's a lot of fun. So, yeah, we look forward to uh, following more of your success. Well, again, thank you guys for the opportunity and I will let you know when the raw skin pod is about to launch. Great. Awesome. Enjoy the rest of your staycation this weekend. <laughs> yeah, you guys too. Take care. All right. See you.